Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's having a good Friday morning. My name is Jim Wendler. I'm the author and creator of 531, but I assume you probably already know that if you're tuning in, unless you're watching the replay. Anyway, uh, it is a great Friday morning. We got our first workouts in for the day. I uh, got a busy night tonight with the London football team hosting their second playoff game. Uh, we did a great job last week. I think we won 57 to 14 or something like that. Whatever it was, it was a good game for us, not for the other team. Uh, anyway, uh, all right, you guys want to get started here? Let's get started. Ask your questions here. I don't know which one works for you, but in the chat, I will address the questions as long as they're uh, something I can answer. And I'm not going to gossip about any other coaches or anything like that. So anyway, JC asks, what is the best template for late stage novices? Would beginner prep school be the best option or does it not matter? I find boring but big tough to recover from. Of course, boring but big is not easy to recover from. Uh, I don't think it matters so much because I, when you people say late stage novice, there's so many things that it could be, you know, what if you're 18? What if you're 25? What if you're 50? There's a lot of things that go into play right there. So it's hard for me to tell you exactly what template to do. Um, but just below that chat, uh, Life with Labradors said he was in the same boat. Uh, and he, <clears throat> instead of running the boring but big, which is five sets of 10, uh, with your first set last, he runs uh, five sets of five. And he also switched to three days a week. I'm a huge believer in lifting three days a week with one main lift a day. So basically, with four lifts, you have a nine-day rotation. Um, and I would probably uh, – you could <clears throat> even run boring but big three days a week. You could try it. But – um, I would rather have you do a uh, four lifts over nine days. The other thing you could do is cut out the five sets of 10 for the boring but big for the squat and the deadlift. I think that really it's hard work and not everyone is, has the ability to recover from it, especially if you're not built to do the deadlift. I think it's very, very tough. So uh, either cut out any of the supplemental work or just uh, do five sets of five. So, but anyway, to wrap it up, go three days a week, uh, cut out the boring but big for the squat and deadlift and either do no supplemental work uh, or do five sets of five and then just uh, use the assistance work to plug in the gaps uh, for each day. Uh, and on your off days, I would still recommend doing something, uh, mostly some type of obviously conditioning and mobility work. Doesn't have to make your nose bleed or anything like that. So. Um, but the other thing too is, you know, I was thought about this today is my next kind of what I'm training for right now is about a year and a half away to when I'm about 50 years old or so. And, uh, so look at stuff from a bigger picture, not just in six weeks, so to speak, uh, and train appropriately within there. So Okay, Brandon Richard says, happy Friday. Well, good Friday, Brandon. John Donovan says, hey, what do you do for conditioning during the cold weather? I do mostly, it depends, it's, as long as it's not snowing icy, nothing changes. If it's snowing icy, uh, just ride the bike. Uh, and my bike is in my garage, and that stinks still because it's freezing in there. And then riding the Airdyne, blast the wind right in you, so I dress like I'm uh, an Eskimo. Uh, so I try not to change anything. I don't care. I've done weight vest walks and stair stadium walks, uh, well below zero. It's not, uh, comfortable, but I think we all could use a little toughness in our life. And I like the, uh, <laughs> I like the challenge of being a little miserable since we are all very too much too comfortable in our lives as it is. And spending an hour being a little uncomfortable is a small price to pay. So, uh, that's basically what is, I, you know, I push the prowler in the cold weather, the rainy weather, stuff like that. Um, but it's, it also depends. Like if it's, you know, we got dumped on by snow, there's no way I'm walking through that, uh, with all the ice and the snow, it's just not going to be that. So 
Maxwell asks, hey, at what point or age in your life did you feel you had to move to a template like uh, like two days a week? Um, I don't know if it's so much age as it is uh, the stress on your body or your priorities in your life, stuff like that. Um, I think I moved to two days a week. I don't know, when I was probably 35 or something like that. But I also trained, the did the prowler three days a week, and I did that fairly hard. So what you have to ask yourself is, are what, you, is what you're doing in the weight in my head, do you have the ability to recover from it? And do you still have, uh, are you still have the ability to go in the weight room and do good work? Uh, if you can train three or four days a week and feel like you can recover from it and feel like you can kick some butt, then I think you'll be fine. So I'm not sure it's so much about age. It's about how your body is. Um, and remember that stress is stress. So if you have stress in your work life or if you have stress in your, uh, personal life, that all needs to be taken into account. So, uh, but <clears throat> I have the big drop off physically for me, was probably, uh, 42, 43. That was like the first time I really had to uh, watch what I ate. That's when I knew like my body wasn't the same. Up until then, I could just pretty much eat anything I wanted. And uh, so I have to be to pay a little more attention to that stuff. And I had to be a little smarter with my training. So, all right. Brandon X asks, uh, is it possible to make reasonable strength and hypertrophy gains by omitting the heavy main lifts and using just assistance exercises? His joints have been bothering him. Reasonable, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's reasonable. But that's one of the, the good and bad things about the main lift. They giveth quite a bit and they taketh away quite a bit. Um, and there is a noticeable change when you do, obviously, heavy deadlift squats, bench presses, not necessarily heavily, but, you know, within the 60, 70 plus percentage. Um, and uh, but, yeah, you can still be reasonably strong and still maintain your muscle mass uh, with the assistance lifts you have to understand that the reason why you're training isn't just to look big and strong or lift big weights it's to feel better and to be awesome and if your joints are always killing you what you're doing is not helping you so you have to make that decision um, and the other thing that you could do is you train your <clears throat> main lifts and do it very low volume very low volume uh, using maybe Prilipin's chart and I know when people do that they get they feel like they haven't done anything uh, sometimes, but that's okay because you have to look at it a big picture over you know 12 to 18 months. Look at all the heavy squats and benches you did, even though after the workout you may not have felt like you did much. So always remember that um, you don't need to smash yourself into the ground like you're 18 years old anymore uh, to get something out of it. So okay, Zach asks, "Hey, I just completed Squattober." I don't know what that is, but I assume it has to do with squatting in October. Me and a buddy have done this for six years. I PR'd with 675, and I always feel my strongest. I know this won't last as it's squatting five days a week. Squat-tober thoughts, that's fine. It's an awesome challenge. Uh, and obviously, it worked for you, but obviously, most people can't uh, maintain that, uh, especially uh, as you get older. And again, the stresses of life and stuff like that. So yeah, go ahead and run it, man, and see you know how long you can last. But uh, you know, I know some people have been able to do stuff like that for a long period of time. I was not one of them, um, but you know, Randy Couture won uh, I think heavyweight championship in the UFC at forty some odd years old, and uh, most people can't do that. So don't always use the exception to prove the rule doesn't mean you can't work hard and do great stuff. It just means you have to be smart about all that stuff. Stephen C. says, do you ever do any direct arm work? Curls, tricep extensions, etc." I did uh, after I got done playing football uh, at the advice of obviously Louis Simmons and all that stuff. But I only really did tricep extensions and tricep pushdowns. I can probably count on my fingers and toes how many times I've done a barbell curl. I'm being facetious, but I never really did anything. I probably should have done them because my arms obviously aren't very big. Um, but right now, do I? No, uh, I don't really care about that stuff. Um, I do a lot of weighted chins, tons of weighted chin-ups, a lot of push-ups. 
And uh, I'm more concerned with my general fitness and my health than I am how big my arms are. So nothing wrong with it though. Uh, I think I take that back. I think for one month, we had a challenge on the forum. We had to do a hundred reps of some kind of arm work every day for 30 days. So that was mostly me doing barbell curls and tricep push down. So, but generally no, although there's nothing wrong with them. So, uh, Michael asks, Hey, would you still recommend beyond five through one style training over a nine day week for a disgruntled master's power lifter? Yes, especially if your master's power lifter is an advanced lifter who knows how to read the signs of his body and make good decisions. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the hard thing about doing some of that uh, advanced style training is you have to be advanced in order to make good decisions. Um, I like how you have the nine day week. I think that's smart. But uh, Michael, just be sure you're making good decisions. And there's a little adage I live my life by. I used it oh my god the other day with one of the kids it's a saying i got from the movie ronin if there is a doubt there is no doubt so when you're training and you have to make a good decision or need to make a decision remember that if there is a doubt there is no doubt um also the i got this from louis too one of the things that he did as he got older was his main lifts his big lifts his barbell lifts the volume went very low, the frequency got much lower, and he really pounded the assistance because um, that's all his body could handle. So remember that. You don't need a ton of volume on the main lifts, especially as the masters, because it just beats you up uh, a little too much. Again, we've already talked about this, especially if you're not uh, genetically suited to do the lifts. The less genetically suited you are to do the lifts, the more they take out and the more you need assistance work to help bring them up. Okay. Uh, KRG says how to improve my pull-ups, doing five pull-ups and 10 push-ups and 15 squats for rounds, but after two to three rounds, can only do one to two pull-ups. So there's a couple ways you do this. One, you do pull-ups uh, and another training session. Uh, throughout the day, just the pull-ups. So uh, you might do an extra 15 to 25 pull-ups every day uh, away from the training. The other thing was instead of doing five pull-ups, 10 push-ups, and 15 squats, do two pull-ups, 10 push-ups, two pull-ups, and 15 squats. And that's one round. And uh, do that you know, for 10 or 15 rounds every day. So break up your pull-ups into smaller sets or instead of doing the 5, 10, 15, right now, just do sets of three. So you would do three pull-ups, 10 push-ups, and 15 squats until you can get to, I don't know, maybe 15 rounds at a fairly good pace and you feel like you can handle that. And then you can up a few sets to five. So maybe <clears throat> four or five rounds out of 15, you would do five and the rest you would do three. Um, so you don't always have to do the same amount of pull-ups every round in that example. So the key with the pull-ups and chin-ups, man, you just have to be patient and you have to build up your volume and be careful about that. Obviously, it's a lot of people, uh, especially when you do overhand uh, the pull-ups instead of I always do uh, neutral grip. Uh, it, it can take a, a, a <clears throat> make your elbows incredibly sore in forearms too. So the more that you can do neutral grip, I think the better off you'll be. That's been my experience and the people that I've worked with and other people that have told me. So Zach says, Hey, were you at West side with Donnie Thompson? Any good Donnie stories? Duh. I was not there with Donnie. I don't think Donnie ever trained at West side. I know he was, and he had his own gym in South Carolina. I think he still does. Uh, Donnie is one of the, smartest lifters I've ever met and one of the funniest we've always had. Uh, I mean, I don't text him every day or anything like that, but he's been very good to me. Um, and I always considered him one of the good guys in this sport because Donnie's one of the guys that does things uh, not, <clears throat> how does he say? He'll look outside the box for answers and he's incredibly smart with that. So uh, and if I did have any good dining, I do have good dining stories, but those will stay with me. I don't think I'm not one of those guys to kiss and tell, so to speak. 
Nothing. I didn't kiss him, though, because that's fucking weird. All right. <laughs> well, he's a good dude, smart dude, and uh, one of the strongest dudes I've ever seen, too. David says, hey, is there anything more tragic than the fact that Shrine Builder only made one album? Yeah, the most tragic thing about Shrine Builder is they didn't even make a good album. They got like one good song on there. I think <clears throat> super groups rarely, uh, rarely do a very, the only one good super group that I can think of that, that's down, uh, that actually was better than the sum of their parts. I didn't think Shrine Builder really did anything that was worth a shit. I mean, Shrine Builder could even, you know, they got Scott Kelly in there. And uh, Neurosis still blows them out of the water. Sleep still blows them out of the water, even though they had Alice's Neros in there. All right. Do you like ring dips for an assistance push? If you can do them and your shoulders can handle them? Yes. I find, he says, he goes on, does Colm say, I find parallel bars are very hard on the shoulder, but rings are fine. That's fine. If that's what you need to do and that's uh, how it feels good, go ahead and knock it out, man. Uh, whatever. Uh, Whatever suits your body and how your body is, just go do it. Again, one of the great things I learned from uh, Dr. Ken Leisner, I'm sure some of you guys know the great Dr. Ken. He always said, my wife is trying to be all sneaky over here. She doesn't want to be on camera. She's in the nude. That's why. Look at that fat ass. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the doctor is getting back to Dr. Ken. He's always said, never worry about what you can do or can't do. Never worry about what you can't do. Only worry about what you can do. Uh, yeah. So I think that uh, works there. And you're doing a dip. Who cares if it's on bars or on rings? It doesn't really matter. That's nitpicking the little crap that doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, no, B. Duggan, I won't play some guitar. I'm not a very good guitar player. <clears throat> I stink. Uh, all right, do you, Brandon then asks, uh, do you place more value on absolute strength or strength in relation to your body weight? And I'm not sure what that means. Curious about your opinion. I just, you talking about me or my kids? I'm just trying to get people generally stronger than they are. Uh, I don't worry about absolute strength or strength in relation to your body weight, uh, if that answers your question. And I don't care what other people think or what other people do. Most of everything I'm doing right now, as far as coaching and stuff, is trying to build stronger, more independent, awesome men. Uh, so I'm trying to build young men, boys, I guess you'd say, teenage boys, into strong, independent, violent men. And part of that is uh, through physical training. And so we just try to get them stronger. Um, obviously, we use their body weight as a measuring tool meaning like we want them to deadlift twice their body weight but i can't ask a 140 pound kid who'll never be two you know 250 pounds to deadlift 600 pounds so um yeah i don't i don't know i don't really have an answer to that i guess okay bob branksley says hey do you think three days of barbell work along with two days of walrus condition is too much for a 50 year old. No, as long as those three days of barbell work and the two days of walrus are done in such a way that allow you to do those five days of training. Okay. So you have to make sure that everything is in proportion. Remember guys, training is like a recipe for a good stew. You don't just throw a pound of everything in there and hope for the best. It's a little bit of this, a little more of that et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yes, you could do that. Um, but again, you'd have to make sure that your preparedness and readiness is addressed in how you train. I hope that answers your question, Bob. I mean, for example, if you usually do five or six exercises on your barbell training, when you introduce the walrus stuff two days a week, you may only have to do two or three lifts on those barbell days because you know those two days of walrus style weight vest stuff or body weight stuff is going to be a little more intensive than they're used to. So just understand that. And as always, err on the side of too light in the beginning. Let your body build up over time. Uh, think about it in the, like the course of a year. So don't try to <clears throat> win a gold medal in the first week of training. Uh, and he says, do you think linear periodization is only for beginners? I'm currently stuck at weight. 
and I'm finding the week to week of using heavy weights to be too exhausting. Do I think linear periodization is only for beginners? Uh, I not sure exactly what you mean by linear periodization. I guess just adding weight every day or every, is that what you're asking any? If you are, um, how do I put this? If you're finding the week to week of using heavy weights to be too exhausting, then you're not doing the correct program. So as an example, we, even with our younger kids, we never move up in weight on the barbell. Uh, and how we do our training until they have perfected. And I am extremely happy with their technique and their effort on the, the weights that they're using. So, um, so while it's still linear, it's not linear every day. We're linear, you know, until they're, uh, it's appropriate for them to get, uh, to add the weight. And I'm very conservative with that stuff because I've noticed that, it's the act and discipline of training consistently that seems to, to uh, make the kids stronger, not just adding weight to the bar no matter what. So I'm a huge believer in being very conservative with that stuff, um, whether beginners or advanced lifters or anything like that or intermediate, whatever you want to say. Um, but if right now your training uh, as you are, is wearing you out, then it's not the correct training for you. doesn't mean your training shouldn't be hard. doesn't mean you can't be a little tired. Um, I just don't, <clears throat> I'm not a big believer in, in bashing your head over and over again uh, just to complete what's on the paper uh, or what you're supposed to do. So use, to make it more simple, use the correct weights on, the, on your lifts uh, in order to uh, complete the workout correctly. I guess that's the best way to put it. We use the appropriate weights and do them consistently. Uh, magically, the kids get stronger. And remember, the training day isn't supposed to be a testing day. It's a training day. You're supposed to get a little bit better. Um, you're not supposed to feel worn the hell out. So, um, all right. David, who asked the question about uh, Shrine Builder, says he loves that record. That's fine. I just... You know, I listened to Neurosis and Cattle Press today. I love Cattle Press. One of the greatest underrated bands of all time with one of the greatest guitar and bass tones of all time. But I listen to a lot of Neurosis when I lift or train or whatever the hell you call what I do. And uh, I am a huge, a huge lover of Neurosis. And I think to really appreciate Neurosis, you need to see them live. It's the greatest live act I've ever seen. Um, and it was just a, one of the, most overpowering bands I've ever seen. So uh, PD8 says, I've been battling back issues that derail my training. How can I replace squat deadlift days to avoid loading the spine, but still do five through one as my lifting routine temporary until back is fixed? Well, this is pretty simple. So I, I'm going to assume that you can do still do the squat and press. So those days stay the same. On the days you generally do squat and deadlifts, just do assistance work that you can handle for your lower body. And you can obviously do some upper body on that day. So for example, we have a kid who can't deadlift or trap bar, uh, hasn't been able to do so. Just got a bunch of uh, physical things. Uh, so we alternate days of belt squats, dumbbell squats, weight vest squats, single leg work. Uh, we usually do that with some kind of jumping in between. Um, and that's what he does on his squat and deadlift days. So we always do some kind of lower body intensive work. It might even be the prowler, the sled or hills or something like that. And then uh, he just does the rest of the work, the assistance work that the other kids do. So yes, but he, you can replace the squat and deadlift with assistance exercises and kind of have a, you know, you can go a little crazy on some of that stuff because you're not squatting or deadlifting. Um, you might have some fun. Some days it might be pretty easy, but as an example, so on the days that you squat or, or and or deadlift, maybe you do put on a 20-pound vest and do, I don't know, 200 lunges per leg, and that's your big leg work. So you always want to keep some kind of leg work that a lot, you know, or, or some exercise that stresses your legs and have a little fun. Uh, well, that's not fun, but you know what I'm saying. So that when your back does heal, uh, that your legs haven't gone to complete duke. So I hope that answers your question, but you can use a variety of exercises. One of the things I did 
uh, because I don't squat anymore is I obviously do weight vest stuff and squats. But the other thing I love doing, and I do this every other day, is I go over to the stadium and put on my wet weight vest and walk up and down the stairs until my legs feel like just absolute hell. And uh, so you're essentially doing, I think I did something like 2,200 and some odd stairs yesterday. Um, and if you don't think that's going to, not going to strengthen and smoke your legs and lungs, then you're either in great shape or you're bananas. So I hope that answers your question. Just replace the main list with assistance lifts and have some fun with those assistance lifts. Think big. Uh, Henry says, Oh, he's the 45 pound captain in the walrus rank challenge. Uh, how, what do you do to prepare for walrus challenges? Honestly, I don't do anything. I've learned not to kind of like build up to them. I have learned that consistently training fairly conservative over a long period of time seems to uh, get me prepared for whatever I do. Even if I'm only using a 20 pound vest over and over again, um, once I put on a 45 or a 65 pound vest, uh, I'm still able to kick ass. And part of that is because I'm able to uh, – my training doesn't beat me up. And I've noticed for an older lifter, the majority of my training isn't so much about making me stronger. It's just not beating me up. So, and I always tell the kids what we do today probably won't make you much stronger, uh, but it can definitely make you weaker. So we have to always train smart. This is especially during the in season. So Henry, the bottom, bottom line is my preparation is my consistency. All right. Uh, I thought about this a little bit today. The greatest superpowers of all time for humans are consistency, effort, and attitude. If you kick ass on those three things, you're going to be okay. Those are the true superpowers in life. Uh, Josh Lation says, what is your goal for when you're 50? Uh, we I'm going to try some uh, weight vest challenges with uh, 150 squats, 100 push-ups, and 50 chin-ups. I'd like to get up to 65 pounds again um, and do that in 30 minutes. So, um, And I also have like little challenges uh, posted on the board that I can do anytime. Uh, so, But that's the main one is just doing the 150, 150 with a heavy weight vest in 30 minutes. Uh, okay. Hey, Jim, I coach nine to 10 year old hockey players. Good God, that's got to be crazy. I want to give them some exercises to do on non hockey days. My thought is to start with bodyweight squats, wall sits, push ups, and jump rope work. I think that's all awesome. I think you could probably add in, let me just look at this. You could probably add in some kind of sit ups or leg raises, just lying on the ground leg raises. Um, if you have if they have a place to run, I think running is super important for young kids, believe it or not. Did I say jumping? Jumping, running. If they have a hill to run hill sprints, um, any kind of, in you know, anything to keep them physically fit. Not, uh, you don't have to do anything hockey specific at that age. In fact, most people don't really need to do many specific things, believe it or not, but that's a whole other story. So, um, but anything just to get them physically fit. So always, I always think about, uh, making them be able to be able to making the kids able to pass like a basic special forces, uh, initial physical exam. So that doesn't mean you're going to try out for seal team six, but you know, pull-ups, uh, some kind of conditioning run, um, push-ups, some abdominal work, stuff like that. Um, I think is a huge thing. And I'm also a giant believer. I know I say this all the time of hill sprints. If you do have access to a hill, um, that would be awesome. I think hill sprints are the, one of the greatest things that you could ever do physically and mentally. So Brandon says, is a Spartan race in Jim Weather's future? Hell no, no way. My body's, it hurts to even take a couple steps running right now. So I have to be smart about that. Uh, if I'm going to be honest, Brandon, my entire training is really, I just enjoy the training process. I had the training process stripped away from me when I got hurt. And I understood for me how, <clears throat> how much I really loved it and missed it. I know everyone kind of understands, uh, but I've been training consistently since I've been 13 or 12 years old or however old you are 
uh, at the end of seventh grade. And the, the process of training is more important than the training goals for me at this point. So I don't really care about competitive stuff. I just care about having and <clears throat> maintaining and building the discipline of everyday good work. So, um, but yes, Casey, yes, they have, okay, this is the same kid, same kid, the same guy who asked about his 10, 9 and 10 year old hockey players. That's fine. 10 to 15 minutes. I, if you look at my video where I train in my young kid, James, uh, my young son, it only takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Obviously they don't have access to a weight room and stuff like that, but you can get, kind of get some ideas of what we do our warm up. We just do, uh, chin-ups, push-ups, and uh, squats is our warm up, and that we maybe do 10 to 15 rounds, or five to 10 rounds. That, as an example, my young son, who is 11, maybe just, oh, God, I don't even know how old my kid is. Oh, I'm such a horrible father. He just did 50 minutes of 10 squats, five push ups, and two chin ups every minute on the minute. He just did uh, 50 minutes of that. Uh, so, um, again, he didn't start like that, but that's kind of what we're looking for. Uh, just basic strength and physical fitness uh, while we teach them the proper form of the main lifts. So, uh, Paul Fulmer asks, uh, I see so much invincible ignorance around me, even in folks who ask for help. When can you tell that someone is actually ready to be helped? Uh, I guess the best way to tell, and I run in this with the kids too, is when they let their egos down and let themselves be coached. And that usually happens. I mean, most of the times it happens pretty quick, but with some of our better athletes, it really starts happening their junior and senior years when they understand, Hey, maybe I kind of know what I'm talking about. I'll let him lead the way. And then what usually happens is, is when they drop the ego and just do what you tell them to do good things happen. Uh, but it's really hard to do that, man. And the best way is you just keep an eye on them and you try to give them good advice and eventually it's going to either stick or it's not. And I totally get that. I had that same, uh, the guy who taught me, Darren Llewellyn, didn't say a word to me basically for six months, told me one sentence, you know, told me a couple things and then let me be, be on my own for another six months. And then he started to help me. And years later, I asked Darren, hey, why didn't you ever talk to me when I was first coming in here? And he said, and I quote, I had to make sure you were serious. I've been coaching and doing this stuff long enough where he's helped people and he's you know, gone on his way to write programs and help them out only for them to be in there for about a week and then quit. So and I, everyone who's been coaching for a long time knows exactly what I'm saying. It's very frustrating when you give all this to other people and they just kind of throw it away. So, uh, you know, just asking for help is one thing, but showing up and doing the work and being consistent, that's when you really know when they're ready is when they show up every day and kick ass and uh, regardless of what they're asked to do. So, um, uh, okay. Space battleship act, Alex. Okay. Hey, Jim, thanks again for doing these. I don't have a question, but I do want to say that I recently switched from the original five through one sets and reps to primarily doing fives pro. And while I miss doing the PR sets, I found that recovery is so much consistent now. I'm turning 51 today, plus all the responsibilities of life makes five pros a logical choice. Choice That is awesome, but remember, you don't have to always do that. Every so often, maybe uh, do two to three cycles of fives pro and then do one cycle of hitting some PRs and then go back to the fives pro. I think that might pepper you in a little bit. Uh, some keep, keep the uh, PRs, keep that uh, lizard brain uh, from getting weak. And I think that might help. Uh, so yeah, but when you turn 51, man, not only do you have the age thing, you have all these responsibilities, you have all of these stressors, man. I totally get it. I totally get it. Let me take a take a sip there okay but i space i'm just gonna call you alex i think you're doing a good thing but don't don't be there's never like a perfect program there's a perfect program for right now so you, again as you've seen you've had to tailor some things back the most important thing is you do what you're able to recover from 
And uh, you can always pepper in the little stuff. As an example, uh, when I do my stupid challenges, uh, I've said this earlier in this broadcast, um, my, I don't work up to the challenges. I just train consistently. And then when it's time for the challenge, I turn it up and get ready to go. Uh, so I think that's kind of where you're at right now. So it just, <clears throat> when you get older, that uh, period where you just kind of mail it in, so to speak, I hate to say that, but that's kind of what it is. You're just kind of working hard and being consistent. Uh, when you get older, that period extends quite a bit. And I totally know what you're saying. Uh, do, 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 do. N E. So it's two letters. Would you recommend the Beyond 53120 week program you wrote for T Nation or second set last and first let last, last combination for a beginner intermediate lifter whose goals are strength? The answer is I would recommend all of those things. Uh, you don't have to just do one thing. So you go from the 20 week program for T Nation and then morph into something else and then go somewhere else. As long as you're consistent and the training maxes are solid and you make good decisions with your assistance lifts, meaning you're doing good work with the assistance lifts and pushing them and uh, doing all the smart things, you're going to be fine. There's not just one thing you can do. I, I fell into that trap when I was a kid. Uh, once I understood that training is a uh, long-term process and there's room for a lot of stuff, is when your mind just kind of gets free and you understand that the work is the most important thing. And if your main goal is strength, you better have a long-term uh, situation on your hands because strength takes time. It takes a boatload of time. And that's why you see a lot of people, I remember Dave Tate told me this, the average like lifespan, so to speak, of a reader at a lead, lead FTS is around three or four years. And we got to thinking about that. And that's about the time where those beginner games start to slow down and you really have to work for it. Uh, and then people get frustrated and quit. You know, it's always the ones that persevere with this stuff that end up doing much better. Um, and those are some frustrating times. I always say it took me seven years to bench, uh, for my bench to go from 300 to 400. And uh, it was a frustrating time. I was stuck and stuck and stuck. And there's some injuries and, you know, you're playing football and all that stuff. And you're doing other things with your body that kind of compromise your recovery. And it was frustrating. And then from 400 to 440 took, I think, three months. And then 440 to 455 took about a, um, six weeks. So... If you stick with it, if your goals are strength, you better be willing to stick with it and look long term. All right. Don't be chasing the if you squat 315 right now, don't be chasing a 700 pound squat in two years. It's just it's going to take a lot longer than that. So um, anyway. All right. Let me see what we got here. All right. Brandon, about the. Uh, do, 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 do. Brandon says that Walrus training is awesome for uh, the Spartan race prep. I, I'm sure it is. So uh, real quick, before we do anything, other questions, is the uh, feed, is it good? Or is it, is it buffering all funny? Are we doing a good job here? So if you someone could comment in the chat section. Uh, we've done some different things to hopefully uh, – counteract some of the buffering issues and the uh, issues. Okay. Looks good. Okay. Thank you. It's very frustrating, man. And I appreciate everyone's patience. I know the last, I think we've done the last four, two of them had some issues with the buffering stuff. So, okay. Some guy named Bobo hipster. Woo. That's a tough one. Hey, he's, he asks, Hey Jim, I did the boring but big protocol and found that deadlifts for five sets of 10 really beat me up. Oh, yeah. Especially in combo with squats for the same. Okay. Any recommendations besides FSL? Uh, so my other recommendation would be to choose an exercise uh, and do five sets of 10 with it. That's not the squat. So as an example, let's say you do your regular squat sets and your five sets of 10 would be using the belt squat machine or the dumbbell squat or doing 50 total reps of weighted lunges uh, or single leg squats. So that's something else you could do. With the deadlift, you could obviously do good mornings, back raises, lighter straight leg deadlifts, uh, Romanian deadlifts, uh, 
The problem with the deadlifts though, man, is it really starts to tank you. So the other thing you could also do is uh, <clears throat> instead of doing five sets of 10, do three sets of 10. Uh, that's another thing you could do even with an alternate exercise. So, um, man, the boring but big, you got to understand it's boring and it's brutal. And the other thing that, you know, we mentioned earlier in the broadcast was instead of going four days a week to uh, <clears throat> train three days a week and do a uh, lift uh, every nine days. It's on a nine-day week. So uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and you space out four lifts over nine days. And that could really help you out too. But try changing the exercises to an easier exercise, so to speak, and see how that works for you. Um, the other thing we used to do for the uh, squat uh, and the deadlift was in place of the five sets of 10, we would go out and push the prowler or drag the sled for something really stupid, or we would do hill sprints. Um, and that would be kind of our supplemental lift, assistance lift, whatever you want to say uh, for our legs that day. So there's a lot of, you can have, once you look at the big picture, uh, you can start having some fun uh, with that stuff. So. All right, here we go here. Doop, 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 doop. All right. We only have a couple more questions here, so. Well, all right, here we go. Chris King says, hey, Jim, any advice on how to deal with tendonitis in the inner forearm and elbow area? Dumbbell rows and chins aggravated. Well, here's the, the big thing is I've had this issue. I think most guys who've been lifting for a while end up getting this issue somewhere. So the first thing would be to cut out the dumbbell rows and the chins um, and just let it heal. So look at the big picture. Uh, don't get all crazy that you can't do dumbbell rows and chins. See if like lat pull downs <clears throat> or any kind of row machine, uh, you can supplement that in as long as it doesn't aggravate it. Let that body, let that uh, that area heal before you do anything dumb. Uh, the other thing is, let me see if I have like something to show you this. Uh, I guess I have a pen. When you squat, you know, you hold the bar like this. Is the other thing is, boop, put the bar through your ring finger and your pinky, and that can take a lot of pressure off your elbows. If you have access to a safety squat bar that will take a lot of the, obviously a lot of the pressure off the elbows. And, uh, so that's the, <clears throat> that would be my uh, recommendation. But again, just cut out the dumbbell rows and chins, man. Don't keep on and don't just cut them out for a week or two. Give yourself four weeks, let it get like perfect. And then start. The other thing is if, if you notice when you add those exercises back in, you notice that it starts to aggravate it then start spacing out. So instead of doing dumbbell rows and chin-ups all the time, do them maybe uh, one of those once a week and then start doing the, the back exercises that you feel uh, <clears throat> don't aggravate it. And uh, I know it stinks. I totally get it, but you have to do what your body's willing to do. You can't just force everything all the time. I've been there. I've tried it. It doesn't work. So listen to your body. Andrew Ross says, how do you measure progress with the walrus work? Say, add more weight to more reps, time to finish workout, all the above. Yes. Um, the big thing with the walrus stuff is once I got to a certain point, uh, I measured progress by my discipline. And then <clears throat> I measured progress by challenges. So uh, I don't think you need to up the weight all the time like you're barbell lifting. I think once you get to a certain point, uh, I think you're going to be good to go. And everyone's certain points going to be vastly different. So um, it depends on your strength level, your conditioning level, your readiness and stuff like that. And it may change over time. But my goal, I never, during my training sessions, I rarely, rarely try to beat the clock or anything like that. My goal is to have a good, consistent workout, you know, once, two, three times a day, uh, and I don't push the crap out of myself because it just doesn't work like that. So uh, <clears throat> the way that I would tell you to do it is measure your progress with your consistency. As long as you're able to do the work uh, with whatever your, <clears throat> your body allows you to do, just be disciplined with that. And then every once in a while, and this, you know, usually do this maybe, I don't know, 
four or five times a year. I'll try something a little crazy. Uh, and as long as I'm able to, to, you know, make, meet that challenge, I know that I'm doing pretty well. So, but the remember guys, the goal of the training is not to make the training testing. You're, not every day is a, is a physical challenge other than getting in there and doing great work. I wish more people would understand that. I wish I would have understood that earlier on in my life. Um, so, okay. Uh, do, 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 Brian Gray. Okay. I, looks like the feed's still going good. Brian Gray says, Hey, I've been running walrus for a while now and I really enjoy it. I recently injured my back. That's not good. And it's been easy to work around than any other program. Yep. I still look forward to working out. Well, that's good. Listen guys, there's never any, uh, the perfect program is the one that you're able to do and your body lets you do and uh, that you can uh, positively commit to. So, uh, I, you know, for some people, this, the weight vest stuff and all that other stuff might not be right. And it's certainly not right for everyone, just like bodybuilding isn't right for everyone or marathon training is not for everyone. So I have noticed that too, Brian. Uh, when I have something kind of feels a little off, I'm very uh, proactive about not irritating stuff. And I just plug in different things. And as long as the key for me <clears throat> is not is to get out into the garage or wherever I'm going and to get work done, even if it seems a little menial and boring, uh, the goal is to never lose that ability to... <clears throat> Um, that consistency when I'm training. So I remember one time I, instead of doing pushups, I did band pushdowns, you know, which is not a very exciting. It's a little stupid when you're, you got the weight vest on, you're doing band pushdowns, but that's what I needed at the time. And I didn't just take time off. So Jim Kincaid says, Hey, do you have any strength advice for throwing athletes such as pitchers and quarterbacks? I have my sons on five through one and tell them not to push the last set too hard the days before a start. Now, Jim, I don't really have a ton of advice on this. A lot of this you have to understand. I don't know. It depends on the age and their strength abilities and stuff like that. Um, Obviously, pitchers are much different than quarterbacks. The throwing motion is very different. And if we're going to be honest, the quarterbacks here at London, we don't throw the ball very much. <clears throat> so, I mean, I guess, you know, uh, but when I did coach the pitchers at the University of Kentucky, I was uh, coached the base, the pitchers, and then I was in charge of the baseball team. Uh, we still bench pressed. We still overhead pressed and stuff like that. We just didn't smoke them like we did like the running backs and the linebackers and linemen on the football team. So but we still did it. You should be still be able to do the movements. And I think your, uh, your prescription, so to speak, is a good one. So, um, and the other thing, especially with uh, baseball players, the most important thing is because especially kids these days are playing like <clears throat> 12 months out of the year is learn how to train them in season because that's basically what they are their entire time. So there's going to be a little bit of a setback early on if they're not used to training, uh, but don't kill them when they train and let them build up slowly. Uh, but you have to learn as a coach when to back off and when to, to push them hard. So um, that's the other thing. That's if, if I'm going to be completely honest this year, this off season uh, at London high school, I've, for me, I've done the best job of in season coaching. Uh, and I, we always have a plan going into the day, but rarely is that plan executed exactly how I have it on paper. You have to be willing to make the smart changes and just because you're supposed to trap bar deadlift or bench press, if it's the kids are given off the vibe that they're not able to handle that, you don't do it. You do what's appropriate for them. I wish more people would understand that. So you do what's appropriate for the athlete at that time and assess their readiness on a daily level. I know that sounds like a lot of uh, mumbo jumbo speak, but it's super important. And we, <clears throat> I think over the last five weeks, we trap bar deadlifted uh, twice. And we came back this week 
and we had uh, kids hitting multiple PR sets, uh, not PR sets, but overall PRs. Uh, so you don't have to just do what's on the paper, do what's appropriate. And I wish more coaches would understand that. Okay. Look at the big picture. Okay. <laughs> uh, and he says, what supplements do you recommend? I'm not very smart on the supplements. Uh, like everyone my age, we all paid what I call the leader tax. And that's when you start believing all the supplements are, uh, you know, are the real thing that's going to make the difference in your, in your training. You know, it's not, uh, you know, the weight gain powder, all that other crap. So, uh, I, I don't really take any supplements other than longevity stuff. Uh, my wife is really big into that. And, uh, so whatever she puts out for me, I take, I don't, I couldn't even tell you what half the stuff is. Um, but if I was the one thing I recommend to our kids all the time is creatine, uh, not just for the physical thing, but I think it helps uh, with your brain too, helps uh, with uh, recovery from concussions and stuff like that. So I, if I had to recommend one supplement, that would be it, would be creatine. And you don't need to take a mega dose or anything like that. A little bit every day uh, makes a huge difference. And the other supplement I would recommend is eating as much whole food and uh, being consistent with your food intake and calorie intake, whatever that is, whether it's high or low, just make sure you're smart with that and be consistent with your training. And uh, you'll have better long-term uh, success with that than going into uh, trying to find out the perfect supplement. So, And here's Brandon Richard with the joke of the day. He says, Rutgers versus Ohio State. That's tomorrow. Are you ready for an upset? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, listen, I'm not from Ohio. Uh, I do enjoy Ohio State football. Obviously, they're fun to watch. I think it would be an absolute insane miracle for Rutgers to beat Ohio State. I don't think Ohio State's as good as uh, in recent years. Uh, their quarterback play is not as good as it usually is. Their run game is has been horrible the last couple of years. Uh, but their defense is playing well. But for Rutgers to, to upset Ohio State, I think that'd be a tough one. And I also think – Oh, my God, what's the head coach at the Rutgers? I think he does a tremendous job. And it feels like he could only do a good job at Rutgers because everywhere else, everywhere else he's gone, he's kind of stunk it up. But wherever, he's got the winning for it formula at Rutgers. So Greg Schiano, I think his name is. Yes. Uh, all right. Sparrow Spit says, hey, for an older lifter, is it better to have a block-oriented approach with few months of strength focus plus less conditioning and next couple months are switched or optimal to train with balance? I think that for an older lifter, it depends. See, you can't, it's hard to say older lifter because I don't know what level they're at. So that is going to be a huge thing. Uh, so, and it also depends if they're competitive power lifters and stuff like that. Um, I think, generally speaking, you're probably better off with a balanced approach that lets you train consistently and then every so often go strength-focused. Okay? And then do a balanced uh, thing for – or balanced training for a couple months and then upping the conditioning <clears throat> for if, uh, if that's what you want to do. Um, but I still think – uh, you need to be balanced and then go every so often, go a little ham loaf on an area and build up to something awesome and then back off again. So balance would be the, uh, would be the norm. And then maybe four, six weeks at the most uh, to build up to something awesome and then backing off. The older you are, the less time you kind of need to, build up, so to speak, as long as you have a balanced program, because it's hard to hold those peaks, man. It's hard to train at that intensity or condition that hard uh, when you're older and older. So go with balance most of the time and then build it up when you need to. And there's going to be different, like you may only need three to four weeks to go out and hit a huge PR. It might be four to six weeks or something like that. But after a while, man, it's going to still, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's going to still I don't know where I'm going with that. But anyway, be smart. Be smart. Let the balance, let the balance of your training prepare you for wherever, whatever block you have coming up for, I guess is the best way to say. 
Ben Moeller says, hey, Jim, why did you create the original Cryptea program? Uh, was it specifically designed for your athletes? It was specifically designed for a couple guys, uh, athletes. Uh, that was I actually created that program before I got to London. So that's – and uh, it went through about a year of – baloney training and uh we went from there so it took about a year to kind of iron everything out so if you can pull that off and do it correctly and someone was asking me about this earlier today about it i think people overdo a little bit on the cryptea program you have to focus on the execution of movement and the purpose of movement and not just trying to beat the time i think that's the number one thing about that so all right Bob Yu says, hey, what's a good way to get my six-year-old starting training, focusing hard on running and jumping right now, but he gets bored and wants to try weights? Uh, good way. Well, the, the thing that we did, we did a whole video on this, is we just did, uh, we, six years old, unless you have the proper training material, is going to be a little tough uh, for him to train. So just be consistent. That's the number one thing. So it's just like uh, in our household, reading is a big thing and everyone has to read every day. Uh, and it's just expected. And that's the same thing with training. Even if it takes five minutes when he, when James was super young, that's what we did. It was part of our lifestyle, just like brushing your teeth and going to bed and stuff like that. So, um, but if he wants to try weights, you have to be able to load him in a way that doesn't compromise anything. So if that feeds what he wants to do, that's fine. But you can't, you shouldn't be loading him with anything that's completely unreasonable. You should be incredibly conservative. And I don't know, at six years old, you're really able to do that other than with a broomstick and stuff like that. So I would be very careful with that. So Brian Gray asks, hey, new merch, new book. Uh, we have some new merchandise, I think from maybe two weeks ago. Uh, I don't know though. Uh, my wife would know better than that and she's gone right now. New book, he asks. Um, I don't know about that. Maybe one day, uh, maybe one day. It takes a lot of time to write a book. It takes over a year, if I'm gonna be honest. It's a lot more work than I think people realize or I'm sure most people kind of understand that. So, but it's a huge commitment, so. Um, Michael Nolan says, do you know Paul Saladino? I don't know Paul Saladino. And what are your thoughts on his belief that vegetables are bad for you? Uh, probably not bad for you. You'll be okay. So just not all vegetables taste very good. And if you're not willing to eat them, then they're not <laughs> – I wouldn't eat them. Okay. So I don't think vegetables are bad for you. All right. Would it be a viable option to do the main barbell work in the gym and then go home and do assistance later in the day? It's a viable option. Yes, you can do that easily. Uh, I think especially if that fits your time and stuff like that, I think you'd be okay. So, uh, do, 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 do. all right, we're almost done here. So please ask any questions if you guys want them answered. Uh, and I will get to it. Yes. Brandon says, hey, Shiano was the defensive coordinator under Urban Meyer Yep, at Ohio State before going back to Rutgers. Yes, he was. Um, yeah, I, you know, I remember when he <clears throat> went to Rutgers, man, Rutgers was a train wreck. And uh, Shiano did a terrific job and did it very quickly. So um, Ben Muller, I'll give you guys about a minute or so if you guys want to ask any more questions. Uh, about the training. we got a big game coming up. It's a home game in our conference. I don't know. But anyway, we beat them once, uh, but they're an awesome team, terrific team, the team I'm probably worried about the most. So uh, I my stomach's been in knock for about two or three days. And uh, even though I'm not out, and obviously the training and stuff like that, so do something a little dumb, especially if you're just watching TV be proud so but thank everyone for showing up i see you guys be awesome stay frosty all that good stuff have a great weekend